How many of you guys watched the games yesterday? How about them hogs? Not very many hog fans in here? How about them hogs? That, that was what? Took, took a miracle, huh? How about, how, about, how about them Sooners? Any Sooner fans in the house? How about them Cowboys? How about them Broncos? Hey, we're, we're, we're fans of the Broncos. Anybody else? Name some other teams you out there in, in, the, in the crowd. Royals. How about them Royals? Give it up for the Royals. How about them Sooners? Give it up for the Sooners. Somebody else. How about them Buckeyes? Give it up for the Buckeyes. How about them Huskers? Give it up for the Huskers. How about them Northside Grizzlies? Let's, let's don't boo nobody. How about them Sooners? Woo! All right, all right. You mad, bro? How about Jesus? <laughs> keep, keep standing, keep standing, keep standing. How about, how about, how about God the Father? How about God the Son? How about God the Holy Spirit? How about, how about the Lord? How about Jesus? How about Savior? How about Redeemer? How about Restorer? How about the one that will make you whole? How about I am that I am? How about the resurrected one? How about the one that ascended? How about the one that is standing? How about the one that is coming back? How about the one that's interceding on your behalf? How about the one that has your name in the book of life? How about the one that hears your prayer? How about the one that answers your prayer? How about Jesus? Glory! Hallelujah! Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Now see, we, if we were at a football game, we'd be bunk, jumping up and chest bumping and all that. How about giving somebody next to you a high five? Amen. Angela, come help me out this morning. Now I know I, you, you guys can be seated if you want to. I realize that some churches might think that this is a little bit extreme that this is a little bit maybe out of order. But you know what? I just believe that we serve an awesome God that has a personality. I believe that as born-again believers, we can live and enjoy life. The Bible says that a merry heart doeth good like a medicine. I don't think it offends God one bit that we come to the house of God and enjoy life. I, I told you guys about the coaches that died and went to heaven, didn't I? I'll tell you all about that. Well, some new people, let me tell y'all. Some college coaches died and went to heaven. You know, the Bible says we're going to all have mansions, right? Well, the, the, the Razorback coach, he, he, you know, he had his mansion over here nice, just decked out and raised the back of tire. Ohio State Buckeyes had this all just, just beautiful, gorgeous. But then all the coaches got together and said, and look at Bob Stoops. Look at that big mansion way up on the hill. It's twice as big as everybody else. Why does Bob Stoops get a mansion bigger than everybody else's? They said, let's go to God and ask him what's the deal. So they come to God and said, God, I love my mansion. It looks great. All the coaches said, they said, but God, why does 
Bob Stoops have the biggest house up on the man, up on the, the hill. Bigger than everybody else. He's got all that OU attire. Why does Bob Stoops get that? God said, that's not Bob Stoops' mansion. That's my mansion. God's an OU fan. Now, for some of you guys don't like that joke, pray for me. I shall not repent. <laughs> Mary Hart, doeth good like a medicine. I'm a Sooners fan, and I love Jesus. I'm a man of God, and I love Jesus. And I know that you do as well. I want to go straight into the word right now. We'll, we'll do our confession of faith at the end if we have the opportunity. But now it's time that we get down to business. Now it's time for transformation to take place. Now it's time for the Holy Spirit to do a work inside of our heart. There's a lot of great men and women out in the congregation this morning. A lot of phenomenal people here. And I don't know all of your stories. Some of you I do. Some of you I don't even know but I want to get a chance to know you better. Some of you are know to a certain degree, but I know about you more in detail because of revelation from the Holy Spirit. Word of knowledge is what the Bible refers to that as. And I just want you to sit back this morning and just allow God to work on your heart. Allow God to minister to you. I want you to sit back and just allow him to show you who he is and what he has in store for you. Don't fight it. Just accept it. Just receive it. I want to start off with a backdrop to kind of bring us up to part to our text. There's a story in the Bible about a man by the name of Lazarus. He had two sisters, Mary and Martha. And the Bible says that God loved these three people. He really loved Lazarus. Just like God loves each and every one of us. Jesus was the type of person that was very approachable. How many of you guys like approachable people? Jesus was very approachable from the, the lady with the issues of blood. People had all kinds of problems. They went to Jesus. Jesus is a problem solver, right? Many times Jesus visited Lazarus, Mary, and Martha, stayed at their home, the Bible says. Here's this one particular time that Jesus was in another city. And Lazarus and his two sisters were in their home in Bethany. And the Bible doesn't say what happened, but Lazarus died. That one that Jesus loved, that one that Jesus fellowshiped with, the one that Jesus communicated with, the one that Jesus ate with, laughed and talked and had fun. The one that Jesus probably counseled and given advice. Now this Lazarus is dead. And their sisters are, I'm sorry, he's, he's sick. He's sick. So the sisters send word to Jesus in the next town and said, Jesus, come. Your friend Lazarus is sick. They wanted Jesus to come and lay hands on him and, and heal him. Jesus got word of this. And Jesus said, his sickness is not unto death. But that the father might be glorified. So Jesus, his disciples were around and the Bible says Jesus did something really weird. Now when you get news of some bad news, someone's sick, seems like you'd leave immediately, especially if you're Jesus, and go and heal that person. In fact, Jesus could have sent the word to heal him. But he didn't. So Jesus said, Lazarus is sick. He sleepeth. We're going to go over and, and take care of him. Jesus stayed two days. Instead of going, he stayed two days. One of the disciples said, Lord, if he's asleep, that's a good thing. He'll be all right. Then Jesus came out and said, Lazarus is dead. Lazarus is dead. So they get ready to head that way after two days. Finally, to get there. It's four days later. Lazarus was dead. Lazarus was in the grave stinking. 
So as Jesus was coming to the town, Martha got wind of it, ran to where he was and said, Master, if you had just come, if you had just been here, Lord, if you had showed up when we first asked you to, anybody ever been upset with God? You asked God to do something, but he didn't do it. Or maybe he didn't do it in your timing and you just had a, you, you had a small window to get this done. God didn't answer your prayer. Or maybe he didn't do it when you asked him to. So she said, Lord, if you had only been here, my brother wouldn't have died. Mary stayed in the house. Jesus told that woman, just just believe. I can raise him up. She said, Lord, I I know that. Everybody's going to be resurrected on, on, on the last day. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth on me shall live. Though he were dead, yet shall he live. She didn't quite understand that. So now Jesus and these people are are at the gravesite. Now you got to understand, they didn't bury them like we do now. They had somewhat like a, 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 a cave. And a large rock over the, over the, the, the front, the facing of it. So Lazarus is dead. His sister said, Lord, he stinketh by now. He's already gone. He's, he's, he's decaying on the inside out. He's already gone. So they're upset. They're weeping. They're at the grave. Let's go to our text. John chapter 11, verse 39. How do you think you would have felt on that day had you prayed that God would come? Maybe you have prayed that God would come, but nothing happened. That person died. Your prayers seemed like they went unanswered. John 11, verse 39. Jesus said, Take ye away the stone. Martha, the sister of him that was dead, said unto him, Lord, by this time he stinketh, for he hath been dead four days. Jesus said unto her, Jesus saith unto her, Said I not unto thee that if thou wouldst believe, thou shouldst see the glory of God. Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead was laid. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me. And I knew that thou hearest me always. But because of the people which stand by, I said it that they may believe that thou hast sent me. And when he thus had spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. Let's stay right there, verse 43. Lazarus was in the grave four days, decaying already, a dead man. Jesus said, Lazarus, come forth. Lazarus, get up out of the grave. Lazarus, come forth. Verse 44. And he that was dead, and he that was dead, and he that was dead came forth, bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was bound with a napkin. Jesus saith unto them, Loose him. And let him go. Here's a man that was in the grave for four days. Jesus said, loose him and let him go. Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus had to get up out of the grave, didn't he? Now I've got three questions for everybody in the house. Three questions for everybody in the house. Why would Jesus want to resurrect Lazarus? from the dead. Think about it. Don't answer it. Just think about it. Why would Jesus want to raise a man from the dead after four days? He'd already died. Why not just leave him there? He's going to be resurrected on that day, right? The Bible says that when Jesus comes back, the dead in Christ shall rise first and we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them. So why would not he just leave him in the grave and wait for that day? There's a reason behind this. Number one, Why would Jesus want to resurrect Lazarus from the dead? So that his disciples and the people around would see the power of God 
and believed that Jesus was the Savior of the world. See, it wasn't for the benefit of just Lazarus, but also people that stood around. He wanted them to see the glory of Almighty God. John chapter 11, verses 1 and 2. The Bible says, Now a certain man was sick named Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and his sister Martha. It was that Mary which anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore his sister sent unto him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom thou lovest is sick. When Jesus heard that, he said, This sickness is not unto death. Listen to this. But for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. Number two, why would Jesus resurrect Lazarus from the dead? Number two, although Lazarus had been MIA, missing in action, God still had a purpose and a plan for his life. Lazarus was in the grave four days, but God still had a purpose. God still had a plan for his life. Some of you were on fire for God at one time, but like Lazarus, for whatever reason, you've been missing in action. You were on fire for God. You were praying. You were seeking the face of God. You were singing. You were giving your all for Almighty God. But something happened and the fire went out. And ever since, you've just been existing. I'm not saying that you don't love God anymore, but you don't have that fire. You don't have that zeal that you once had. You've been missing in action. Lazarus could do nobody any good in the grave. Please don't take this the wrong way. But where you are right now, you're not doing anybody any good spiritually. Pastor, that's harsh. That's truth. That's real. As the young people say, that's 100 right there. But guess what? We serve the God of the resurrection. Lazarus had been missing in action. God still had a purpose and a plan for his life. Some of you were on fire. Have you ever met someone that was just on fire for God? I mean, they just were going 100 miles an hour. I mean, God just oozed, and just oozed from their eyes and their ears and their spirit. You just got close to them and you could feel the presence of God. But something happened. Something happened. Here are some possibilities of what may have happened to you. Someone hurt you emotionally. Man, emotional hurts can just put a dagger in your heart. Someone hurts you emotionally. You experienced hurt from a church. Man, that right there is a big one. People leave churches and go to other churches because that church hurt them. Or maybe it wasn't that church, but someone in the church. Maybe it was just a Christian period. And you said, well, man, if that's the way God is, I don't want to be a part of that. Maybe someone hurt you in another church. Maybe some church hurt you. You experienced a tragic or difficult event and became angry with God. In a moment of truth, besides me, and I'm going to say I have, besides me, who's been angry with God? Don't worry, you're not going to go to hell for being angry with God. Don't you know that God understands you're going to get angry with Him? <laughs> God knew that you were going to get angry before you got angry. But God is big enough to handle that. God is big enough to allow the Holy Spirit to bring healing to your heart and healing to your mind and healing to your hurts. But maybe God disappointed you. And since God disappointed you, you became angry. You became bitter. You became just calloused. Doesn't hurt the feelings of God. God can handle angry people. God can handle bitter people. God loves angry people. God loves bitter people. Why? Because he can touch their hearts. He can touch their mind. He can take that heart of stone and cause it to turn into a soft place so that the word of God can penetrate. You got distracted by the things of this world and simply took your eyes off of God. 
that can happen to the best of us. It can happen to anybody. You got distracted by all of these things that are going on and took your eyes off of Almighty God. You messed up moral or ethically and was ashamed and felt condemned. You messed up morally or ethically and felt just so horrible, felt so bad about it that that relationship between you and God just wasn't there anymore. Just isn't there anymore. That doesn't mean that you stop believing. That just means that you didn't want to face the people that knew you. You didn't want to face the people that believed in you and trusted in you. You didn't want to face the people that knew that you loved God. You didn't want to be around them because you felt so bad about what you had done. And you have all kinds of thoughts of what they're thinking about you. Because of your mess up, you felt that you felt that if God, because of your mess up, you felt as if God couldn't or no longer wanted to use you. you know, a lot of people has been there. You messed up. You blew it. And everybody knows what you did. God knows what you did. And as a result, you felt like, man, God can't use me anymore. How, how in the world is God going to use Man, I did the dirty of the dirty. I've messed up beyond measure. Why would God want to use someone like that? Why would God want to use me after what I've done, after what I've said? And everybody knows, people have walked away from God now because of what I've done. Why would God want to use me? How could God use me? I've, I've tarnished my character. I have misrepresented Jesus. So why in the world would he want to use me? How could he use me after what I've done? Here's my response to all of those situations. Jeremiah chapter 1, verse number 5. Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee, and I ordained thee to be a prophet unto the nations. Preacher man, break it down. What are you trying to say? I'm trying to say this right here. Before you did what you shouldn't have done, God knew you were going to do what you did. But yet and still, God chose to call you forth to place his anointing inside of you, to place his purpose on the inside of you. So what you've done does not cancel out God's purpose for your life. Did you hear that? God knew you were going to do what you did before you did it. But that didn't stop him from calling you forth before your mama knew who you were. Before you were born, God had a purpose and God had a plan for your life. So because of your failures in life, because of your mess up, that doesn't cancel it out. So here's what we need to do. We need to get past what we've done and connect with what we need to do. Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11, the Bible says, For I know the thoughts. Don't you know God thinks about you all the time? Yeah, God thinks about what I've done all the time. No, God doesn't think about what you've done all the time. God's not like your friends, so-called friends that will condemn you when you mess up. Don't be offended by this, but God's not even like you in that sense. How many of you have ever messed up and you beat yourself up over for days and weeks and months and even years down the road? Now, I know you've never done this. How many of you have asked God to forgive you for something and then you turn right around and ask him to forgive you again for the same thing? Then the next day you start feeling about again and you ask God to forgive you again. And then a week later, a month later, maybe even a year later, you're still asking God to forgive you for the same thing that you've done. God forgave you the first time when you asked him. God's thoughts toward you are good. God has a purpose and God has a plan. No matter who you are, no matter where you've come from, God's got a purpose and God's got a plan. Romans chapter 3, verse 23 and 24. The Bible says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Well, preacher, that sounds good, but I bet your sin is not as bad as my sin. 
Preacher, I bet you hadn't done what I've done. You hadn't said what I've said. You hadn't been where I've been. Well, I bet you don't know the grace of my God. See, we put measurements on sin. If you lie, that's right here. Well, if you steal, well, that's right there. If you kill, that's right there. If you do this, if you do that, well, no, guess what? There are different consequences of our sins, but sin is still sin. And God is the forgiver of them all. God is the forgiver of them all. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, the Bible says, If we confess our sins, He is just and faithful to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He, being God, is just and faithful to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I don't care what you've done or how long you've done it. Even if you did it yesterday, the Bible says if we confess our sins, God says what he means and he means what he says. He'll forgive us. Here's the third thing. Here's the third thing. Why did God raise Lazarus from the dead? The call of God, the anointing of God, and the favor of God would benefit no one while entrapped in Lazarus in the grave. The call of God, the anointing of God, the favor of God would benefit absolutely no one. See, God still had a purpose for this man. And when God has a purpose for his life, or since he did, the anointing, the favor, and the call was there. But it would do no one any good entrapped in Lazarus in the grave. Now, that right there is a great point. You guys agree that's a good point right there? That point right there is not as great as my next point. Let's show it. The call of God, the anointing of God, and the favor of God will benefit no one while still entrapped in me. Stagnant. Right where you are, you've quit working for God. Right where you are, you're not in the place where you need to be in God. God's anointing is up on your life. God's favor is up on your life. God's call is up on your life. Let's go back to the call. Stay right there where you are. The call of God. The call of God is not just for preachers. The call of God is not just for evangelists. The call of God is for every man and woman of God. If you are a born-again believer, you are called by our Heavenly Father. Now, I want you to do this with me. I want us all to read this right here together. Make it personal. The word me, when we say it, think about yourself. Let's say it together. You ready? Here we go. The call of God, the anointing of God, and the favor of God will benefit no one while still entrapped in me, stagnant. Let's say it again. Let's go. The call of God, the anointing of God, and the favor of God will benefit no one while still entrapped in me. This time, I want you to say your name. Instead of saying me, say your name. Ready? The call of God, the anointing of God, and the favor of God will benefit no one while still entrapped into Shayla, stagnant. That hits everybody in the house. Every man, every woman in the house, you're called by God. God's anointing is up on you. You've got to have the anointing to be able to do what God wants you to do. It's the anointing of God that breaks the yoke of bondage. It's the anointing of God that makes the difference in your life. It's the anointing of God that that destroys the enemy's traps. It's the anointing of God. You can have a great, great singer. We've got some great singers in the world. But give me an anointed singer any day over someone that's just a great singer. Good singer will make me feel good. Good singer will make me clap my hands and all that. that. That's what good singer will do. Nothing wrong with good singers. 
but anointing singers, anointed singing will touch your heart right here. Anointing singing will allow the Holy Spirit to work through that voice and do a work that a great singer can't do. Anointed singing will call you, cause you to weep right there in your seat. Anointed singer will have you walking down here to the altar or crawling down to the altar, crying your heart out to Almighty God. The call of God, the anointing of God. You don't have to be a preacher to be anointed. Did you hear that? You don't have to be a pastor to be anointed by God. The favor of God. Why do we need the favor of God? You need the favor of God because there's some doors that you can't open. But the favor of God will open those doors that no man can close. As I get ready to close, I'm going to say this right here. Some of you may feel as if you've never been on fire, but know that you need to start serving God with your whole heart. God is calling you forth today. Two different groups. I'm going to put the last point up. Our second to last, second to the last, my fault, second to the last. Two different groups. Group number one, those are those that, that just started out on fire for God. Had that zeal. No devil could stop you, but you went through a situation in your life and you're not where you used to be with God. But then there's the group where you may not have been on fire for God, but you still aren't where you should be. You're stagnant right now. You're just in that place. You're just, you're just existing, not doing anything. You love God. God loves you. But you're not fulfilling your purpose. In a sense, you're in a grave of stagnation like Lazarus was. Lazarus could help nobody where he was. My last point. My last point. I've got just a blank line right there with two words. Come forth. Jesus said, Lazarus come forth. But then Jesus told them to unwind this man and set him free. He said, loose him and set him free. Remove the napkin from him. Remove those bandages from him so he can go out and be about my business. See, the word of God has come forth today to loose you and let you go. Not just live. God don't want you to just live after today. But God wants you to come out of that grave of stagnation. God wants you to come out of that grave of hurt. God wants you to come out of that grave where you're feeling sorry for yourself. How much longer will it be that you're going to stay there? Another five, ten years? Until you hear the trumpet when, when, when Christ comes back? Well, preacher, I'm saying that's all I need. Well, that may be all you need. What about people around you? What do you think the anointing is for? The anointing is for you, but to be a blessing to somebody else. Whoever you are, you put your name in there. You know who you are. You know where you need to be. God is saying, come forth. God is saying, step up. God is saying, come up out of the grave today. God is saying, to stop. it's time that you stop remaining where you are. It's time that you get up and be about the Father's business. The fire that you once had, God wants to ignite again. The fire that you never had, God wants to give you. Let's go ahead and turn the lights out. We get ready to give the invitation. Come forth is all I'm going to say. Jesus said, well, let, let, me, let me do this. Jesus said, Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus got up out of the grave. For those of you today that are in a grave, God is saying to you, come forth. Whether this grave is because of something that you've done in your past or whatever the case might be, or whether you're in the grave that you've never really become the man or the woman of God that he wants you to be, it's time that you get up out of the grave. To count of three, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands. And some of you, this may be your first time being here. Maybe your first time being here. If God is speaking to your heart, I want you to obey the Holy Spirit. I'm going to give an invitation only for the people, only for the people 
that are ready to get up out of that grave. And this is not just a little walk down to the altar and a little tap on the head and pray for you. No, this is your point of saying today is going to be a brand new start for me. Today is the day that I'm going to get myself in order with God. That's not to say you're not saved. But this is to say that today is the day for a new beginning in my life. I will live again spiritually. I will be in tune with God in my life. Whenever I say, Lazarus, come forth, whoever you are, you get up when you feel the call, or if you feel the call to come to this invitation, to come to the altar for the invitation today. I'm just going to say three words. Lazarus, come forth. And if that's you, I want you to get up and come right here so I can pray for you. Amen. Ready? Here we go. Lazarus, come forth. Everybody right now, I want you to come if you know that's your call. I want you to come right now. Let's, cl- let's clap as they're coming right now. Hallelujah. Come on now, we can do a better job than that. If you know that God is calling you forth, I want you to come right now. You know that God is speaking to your heart, even if this is your first time being here. I want you to come. Nothing that you need to be ashamed of. Nothing you need to be embarrassed. Oldness is 